Okay, great. So have you guys like started looking at things? Excellent. Good. Okay, so I'll cover that in a lot more detail. All right, so like I said, I'm going to start with my three men path. Um, so a little bit just about myself. I actually was born in the Philippines. I wasn't born here. And I came here when I was five years old, and my parents brought me here without legal immigration status. And that was something that was really like a big challenge for me. I actually um, didn't realize that I was undocumented for a very long period of time. You know, I grew up here feeling essentially very American. And yeah, I hit college and realized at that point, you know, my dad asked me to uh, take a picture for a fake green card so that I could actually go to college and be able to get my degree. Anyway, um, so college was great. I went to UCLA, I was very fortunate. Yeah, I, I very happy Bruin. Uh, went to UCLA and originally I guess my path was that I wanted to pursue clinical psychology. That was the first thing that I was really interested in. I really loved working with people, um, just having that, that kind of interaction and understanding like how do people, how do people think and how do people behave and how can you help people in that setting. Um, and in the process of learning more about that path, realized that I felt like I needed more. Uh, I did a lot of uh, research and I actually worked with children who were uh, developing autism or who are at risk for developing autism. And in working with the kids, I realized that psychology is very much focused on approaching behavior, like understanding behavior and intervening along those lines. Uh, but it doesn't really give you the full perspective of a person, right? Like, the, like holistically, like how is the person doing? So I would work with kids who were having other issues. For example, like I had one child who was having seizures the entire time that I was working with the child, and I just felt like I wanted more. I wanted to be able to help that child in other ways besides, um, you know, just working with the way that they were behaving. So anyway, um, again, this is actually just. Uh, it's a scholarship poster, and these are all quotes from other students who are undocumented. Uh, what happened to me was I was able to get through college. I was very fortunate that my parents were able to help me and support me as I um, worked through college. But after I graduated and realized that I wanted to pursue medical school, that's when it hit that this barrier was in my way. Like being undocumented meant that I was ineligible for any kind of federal financial aid. Uh, it meant that most medical schools would not even take a look at my application, or if they were to look at my application, it would mean that they would see me as an international student and I would have to pay much, um, much, much more money. So it was tough. Like, uh, again, uh, people who are like me and documented, we tend to figure out what, what that means at different points in our lives. Like, some people figure it out much earlier. I kind of figured it out a lot more when I graduated and again, felt like my opportunities for higher education were limited. Um, anyway, uh, so what did I do with my time? Again, go to UCLA, it was awesome. I was able to actually um, find a job at UCLA, so that was very fortunate. Uh, I think I just kind of slipped through the system. I didn't have a legal work permit, uh, but I think maybe the way that I speak or the way that I presented myself, they just didn't check any of that, and I went right into autism research at UCLA. So at UCLA, I did uh, about six years of autism research. So just um, in terms of my timeline, I actually graduated in 2006. Uh, and at, starting at that point after I graduated, I was able to get this opportunity to work in research at UCLA. Uh, and yeah, uh, in addition to that, I've like, oh, Three years ago, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this uh, executive action that uh, President Obama passed a couple years ago called DACA. Are any of you familiar with it? Okay, just a handful of people are familiar. Essentially what President Obama did was he issued this executive action so that anybody who, like me, came to the United States when we were really young uh, and met certain other criteria, for example, you know, our criminal record is clean, like those kinds of kinds of uh, requirements. If you meet all of those different requirements, then it gives you a social security number and you would have a work permit, a legal work permit, and really just a lot of doors opened for me at that point. Um, one of the great things that happened was that 
with a legal work permit, with a social security number, it made it possible for me to apply to medical school. Um, a lot of advocacy has actually um, opened up that path for me. So this is actually an organization that I work with called Free Health Dreamers, and it's a nationwide network of undocumented students who are pursuing careers in health. And through them, I've actually been able to have a lot of conversations with people like medical school administrators, uh, people who are you know, able to, to basically make these decisions about whether or not they would, would support and allow undocumented students to enter their schools. And so for people like me, it's now become possible for us to get accepted to, to work with any of these programs. Uh, so yeah, so this was actually, um, this particular picture is from an NPR um, piece that I, I actually got to be a part of. Dreams become reality for undocumented medical school, uh, med medical students. So we all know getting into medical school is tough, but if you're undocumented, it's even harder. President Obama's executive action on immigration has helped unlock some doors, giving lawful presence to young immigrants who came to the U.S. as children. So now some of these students are knocking on the doors of the med schools. And yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. Like I've been involved in a lot of this advocacy work that has opened up the doors not only for me, but for other students. So that basically means since I graduated from UCLA in 2006, I have had a very non-traditional path to medical school, right? Uh, I couldn't enter you know, the first class like as soon as I graduated from undergrad. And so what did I do with my time? I tried, you know, it was really hard. Like I, I'm not gonna lie, like I went through some really tough periods of depression and you know, I dealt with anxiety and you, know, you have other fears when you're undocumented. There's a lot of um, anti-immigrant rhetoric in this country right now. Uh, and, you know, basically, again, I grew up here, but I'm being told that I'm a criminal just for the fact that I didn't come here with the right documents. Uh, so that was really hard. And uh, I, I almost gave up, to be oh. honest. Like, almost, huh? Sorry. I just, oh, <laughs> messed up. <laughs> yeah, so I, I almost gave up. and. Uh, I think it took a lot for me to find that strength to get back on this path. But in the, in the meantime, again, I had nine years to, to prepare for medical school. So this is what I did. Uh, I took a lot of classes through UCLA Extension. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but basically you can take classes at UCLA. Uh, it costs now, I think, like seven to $800 per class. It's pretty expensive. Uh, but luckily, because I was a staff member at UCLA, I actually got a 25% discount, so that was kind of nice. And I just took kind of a class at a time, or two classes at a time, just to keep myself fresh. I took a lot of upper division coursework like cell biology, uh, developmental biology, human anatomy and physiology, biochemistry. I took just tons of that stuff just to make my application as strong as possible when I would have the opportunity to, to make this to, to submit this application. I did that. Um, in terms of leadership, so you know with medical school, right, it's very competitive. You wanna get a lot of different experiences on your application, and again, I, I strongly encourage that if you are going to get involved in different things, that you get involved in the things that you are passionate about, you really care about these things, and that's gonna shine through uh, when you're talking to people. You're not just trying to you know, check off a bunch of um, check boxes, right? Like, oh, I got the research experience. Oh, I got the leadership experience. It's not about that. It's about doing the things that you really care about, okay? Uh, so I did. So in terms of, but if you were to look at all these check boxes, right, this is what I did. In terms of leadership, I've done a lot of advocacy work, again, for undocumented students. I work with this um, organization called Free Health Dreamers. So again, if any of you are undocumented or if you know anybody who you might want to connect me with, please feel free. I'll, I'll leave my contact information at the end, so if you want more information on that, let me know. Uh, I co-founded a student organization at UCLA called Med Dreamers, so it's a medical student organization. I basically talked to medical students at UCLA and told them, your school is accepting undocumented students, but there's no financial aid support for them. And you know, they basically rallied behind their, their peers and were like, okay, then we need to fundraise for these students together a fundraiser this year uh, and raised about $17,000 in scholarship money for undocumented medical students at UCLA. So 
those are things that I, that I did that I'm proud of. In terms of clinical experience, I worked, at, again, in autism research where uh, the students that or the research subjects that we were working with were at risk for autism. So I had a lot of fun. I worked with kids all the time doing behavioral assessments and uh, working with them in terms of providing social skills therapy since autism is a social skills and communication disorder. For research experience, again, I'm very non-traditional. I had nine years of experience, so I dove right in and I have about five publications that I've been able to put out there. It was really, really tough. I, I still struggle with the writing process, but I've learned um, by getting involved in research how you know you go through the process of conducting your own studies and how you put together your own research papers. So that that's cool. And then in terms of community service, I do a lot of workshops for undocumented students, you know, teaching them about the types of financial aid opportunities that they can tap into, uh, basically mental health support since it is a very difficult thing to be undocumented. Uh, I've created and hosted MCAT classes, I like to teach that, and I do a lot of mentorship with other students who are disadvantaged, low income, undocumented, those types of things. And all of those things, again, are things that I'm really passionate and excited about and that I find really fulfilling. It's not just to check it off that I did this for medical school. Okay. Uh, those are some of my papers. One of the papers that I wrote is actually a perspective piece on undocumented students going into medical education and what deferred action for childhood arrivals, that, that executive action I talked about, DACA, that's actually um, the piece that talks about how that reduces our barriers to higher education. Uh, this is uh, with some of the people that I work with in pre-health papers. So in addition to advocating for uh, education equity, uh, I also ad uh, advocate for health equity. Uh, for those of you, I don't know, who might have family members who are undocumented, I don't know if you're aware that when the Affordable Care Act passed, they actually specifically excluded people who are undocumented from accessing affordable health coverage. And so even though the Affordable Care Act actually expands health care access for many people who didn't have it before. There's still 11 million undocumented people in this country, and if they don't get health care through work, they're, you know, they're out of luck, right? Uh, and again, from, you know, working with this community, I know it's really, really hard because a lot of times you just forgo getting the care that you need because you can't afford it. So here in California, there's a senator named Senator Ricardo Lara. Have any of you heard of him? So what he's actually been pushing is for a, a, an act that would allow healthcare coverage to expand to undocumented people in the state of California. Federally, it's not gonna happen, right? Like in, as a nation, it's really difficult to get these types of things to pass. There's, again, a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric, yeah. Yeah, one would think that insurance companies would want that. Yeah, um, but, you know, again, it depends on the culture of the state that you're yeah. in. I think California is it's going yeah. to happen in any state, it will be California. Yes, so there was actually an expansion. So his full bill did not pass here in California. He really wanted to expand healthcare to everyone in California who was undocumented, but it didn't happen. The bill that he was able to get passed this year expands health coverage for undocumented immigrant children. Yeah, so there's still a lot of work that needs to happen, but basically this was, uh, this is still an ongoing project. We are still advocating for this to happen in California legislature. The problem is financing it. It's really expensive. Yeah. Can you still get just basic health care on campus like you can here? Um, I don't know. Like those are policy decisions that are made by people at the school, right? Uh -huh. So like if your school is open to providing health care services to undocumented students, that's wonderful, right? But there are other schools that you know students might not feel comfortable even going in because they'll ask for things like an ID. If you don't have that, you know, again, it's, it's tough. So this is another one of the things that I have been working on. Yes, sorry. Oh, I flipped it. I thought you were just gonna follow it up. Uh, this is actually, so I shared my story on the Senate floor. So Senator Dick Durbin uh, was actually defending DACA. So again, DACA, this, this executive action that Obama did, it's wonderful because it's helped a lot of people, again, like me. There's about 1.5 million undocumented immigrants in this country who came here as children and who would qualify for this, this deferred action for childhood arrivals. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in Congress, many Republicans are trying, have tried to defund that program. And this was actually
actually Senator Dick Durbin defending that program and say, you know, we shouldn't be funded because there are people, you know, who are trying, for example, like me, to go to medical school and to give back to our communities, even though we aren't documented. We're still very much American. And again, so this was um, the group Med Dreamers. So I worked with them in fundraising for the medical students at UCLA who are documented. And that's actually uh, one of the MCAT boot camps. So have any of you heard of MedPEP at UCLA? Yes? Okay, a few people have. So Nguyen Pham, you guys know him, right? Yeah, so he's actually the reason that I was invited here today. He is also a peer mentor with MedPEP. So MedPEP is a pipeline program that I work with. And if you guys apply, so go ahead and, and take down the, I should have brought flyers actually, you guys can take down the email address for this program. What we do is we work with high school students all the way up through post fact. Most of our students are community college students, and what we do is when you apply for the program, you get matched, if you get accepted into the program, you get matched with a peer mentor. Um, so someone like me, for example, and we would follow up with you and your personal and academic goals for the entire year. So like, I'm very close to my mentees. I talk to them um, pretty, pretty regularly, like I would say, at least monthly, at least bi-weekly. Some people I actually talk to on a weekly basis, right? Um, and again, I just provide a lot of support to those students. So in addition to getting a peer mentor assigned to you, you also have to come to UCLA once every other month for a six-hour workshop. Uh, and we cover things like leadership, study skills, um, health policy, and professional development. There's just a lot of information that we try to give our students during those workshops. and. Yeah, I think it's a really great program. Again, Nguyen was actually a mentee through that program and now he's a mentor um, for that program. And we've also been doing things like the MCAT boot camps that I've been hosting have been through MedPEP. <coughs> okay, so now I'm gonna jump into your timeline. Uh, I want you guys to start thinking, so you're all pre-medicine, right? So this, is, this is a pre-med club. So I want you to start thinking about what your timeline is going to look like for the next five years, okay? I know it seems like it's a really far period out, but you have to think about it because there are a lot of little pieces that you need to know in order for you to hit the timeline that you want, okay? And not everybody knows these things. So one, when do you want to go to medical school? So are you planning on taking any time off? And if yes, how much time are you planning to take in between undergrad and medical school? So how many of you want to go straight into medical school? There's a couple people, great, okay. And how many of you are thinking about taking a gap year? Okay, a couple people. And how many people are thinking of taking two gap years? Okay, so you guys mostly really want to go pretty much straight into medical school or close to straight into medical school, okay? Now, you're at the community college level right now, so you still have to think about transferring into your four-year university, correct? Once you get into your four-year university, so just so you know, the medical school application timeline is such that it takes a full year for you to start medical school. So when you submit your application, again, it takes a full year before you're going to even enroll. That means for those of you, say, who are planning on going straight out into med or straight into medical school, you should be submitting your application in June of your junior year, which also means that you need to take your MCAT before June of your junior year. So that means right now, if you're actually transferring next year, next year you're already preparing for the MCAT, or now you know, you're preparing for the MCAT and you're preparing your application for, for submission. If you are planning on taking just one year off from medical school, so just one year off means that you're gonna be submitting your application in June when you're graduating from undergrad. So when you're finishing your undergraduate application, that's when you submit and you'll have a year gap in between for you to uh, get your, all of your interviews done um, and start the process of moving out to wherever it is that you're going to school. So just things to think about, again, because I didn't know this at first too, um, so it's very important because again, if your goal is to go straight in, start thinking about now, you know, when you're gonna be preparing for the MCAT and when you're gonna be submitting your application. Okay. Oh, yeah, so again, note that going straight into medical school, submit the application June of your junior year. Isn't it better to take a gap year so you can have more clinical experience? Well, 
also think about, again, if you were taking a gap year for that purpose, right, um, you wouldn't be able, you would have already submitted your application in June. And so that gap year is kind of like you can do whatever you want. You can do a lot of things that you're interested in, but it won't show up on your application. If you want to take a full gap year to get clinical experience before you submit your application, then you're technically taking two years off. Okay, so timeline during the year that you apply. The MCAT is actually given at different times of the year. And I didn't include the slide with all of the dates, but you can look it up online. It's very easy to find, so MCAT dates. And when you look at it, you know, you can take it in January, you can take it in February, you can take it in March, April, like there's dates all over that you can take the MCAT. However, if you want to take the MCAT and include it in the application, the latest that you can take it, um, well, not the latest, the latest that you can take it in order for you to submit your med school application early is April, okay? So if you take the MCAT by the April 23 test date, this ensures that your scores will be posted by the time you submit your application, okay? Now, how many of you are familiar with the application process for medical school? Have you like looked into it or heard anything about it? No, okay, so good, then I'm covering this. The way that it works is it's a rolling application, okay? And because it's a rolling application, you are at an advantage the earlier that you submit. Uh, what rolling application means is that they start reviewing applications as they roll in, and that they might start already offering positions to students. So the longer that you wait to apply to medical school, the fewer spots remain, right? So ideally, and since you guys are young, and you guys are you know, just really early in your Careers, I want you to think about that because ideally you want to submit your application in June. The application opens up June 1st and it's actually like in May the application system is open online so that you can log in and you can already submit or you can already start typing everything in and then once June 1st hits you can press submit. Okay so I want you guys to shoot for that. It's totally okay to submit your application later in the cycle but again, it just means that there are fewer spots that are available to you. The stronger your application is, the more likely it's okay that if you know, you've waited this time. Uh, but again, I would highly suggest that you prepare mentally to submit your application June 1st, okay? So what happens when you submit your primary application? After you submit, so the way that it works as well is that it actually um, requires a full month for them to even finish processing your application. And the reason for that is you're going to manually input all of your grades into this application. Every single grade you have. It doesn't matter if you had to retake a class or if you had or if like your school wiped your grade. You actually have to input absolutely every single course that you've taken. And then once you've done that, uh, they'll go and verify everything according to your transcripts. Like a physical person has to go back and double check that you did not lie about all of your grades. So that process takes a full month, okay? So you're submitting your application to this system called AMCAS, and after a month, that's when they go ahead and release your information to all of the medical schools that you are interested in applying to, okay? Now, once you've submitted your primary application and it's been verified, so that's the term for it, right? They've checked all of your grades, you're good, you didn't lie about your grades. Um, and yeah, so once you've submitted that, uh, schools can then decide whether or not to send you a secondary application. So not every school requires a sec, or not every, not every school will send you a secondary application. They all have one, okay? Some schools automatically send secondary applications to absolutely everyone who applies to their program. It's a way for them to make money. Um, and other schools will only um, send you a secondary application after they've reviewed your primary application and decided that you're qualified, okay? A lot of the UC schools are like that. You actually get screened. Um, but for a lot of other schools, you don't get screened. You just get an application, okay? Now, the secondary application is it's different for every school. You can actually kind of gauge what the school is interested in learning about you based on the secondary application. Some schools will have literally 10 pages of questions for you. It's a lot of work. Some schools will only ask one or two questions. Some of the questions, again, it gives you an idea of the culture.
culture of the school because some of the questions are like, are you an advocate? Like, what is your role as an advocate? How do you uh, work with underserved communities? So you can judge from those questions, like, oh, the school is really interested in people who are interested in serving the underserved, right? Other schools are going to ask you, what are your accomplishments? And so you know from that, like, okay, this school is much more interested in having, like, a very competitive kind of environment, right? They're looking for people who are, whatever their standard is for, like, the cream of the crop, right? Uh, it could be your research skills, it could be uh, the awards that you've gotten, those types of things. Those secondary applications take forever because they're long essays. Like, it's not just one personal statement, it's like 10 personal statements, okay? And since they take forever, and since you have a full month from the time that you submit your primary application to the time that you get to your secondary, my advice would be for you to actually start pre-writing. So you submit your primary. This is like the insider stuff that I didn't know when I was going through this process. Once you submit your secondary, you can actually look up online and see what types of secondary application questions other students have been asked um, or that schools have given in previous years. And you can start writing your answers to all of those secondary applications so that once you receive the secondary, you can submit it. Because again, you're racing against the clock. It's rolling admissions. And if you don't submit your secondary application that quickly, the school is gonna have a sense that you're not very interested in them. And some schools even tell you, like, here's a secondary, you have a week go, right? And yeah, so just so you know, the year that you're applying is gonna be extremely busy. So if you're planning on doing this while you're still taking your classes, you're still a junior, senior in, in your four-year university, this is a lot, a lot of work, and this is gonna take up all of your summer. Do you guys have any questions about that? Okay. So the cost, it's about $40 per primary application, it's about $100 for secondary application. I applied to 20 schools. That meant that it was $3,000 for me. Uh, a lot of people think that 20 schools is not even that many because it's very competitive. So for some people that I know, they've applied to 40 schools, which would then be $6,000 just for you to go through the application process. So know that it's extremely expensive. However, have any of you heard of the fee assistance program? No? Okay, so actually if you are low income and you qualify for fee assistance, this is something to look into. Uh, look it up as AAMC um, FAP, the assistance program, and you'll basically have to include information about how much money you earn and also about how much money like your parents earn. I think you have to just basically upload your taxes, right? If you qualify for fee assistance, they reduce your MCAT fee from $300 to $115, and you actually get free access to MCAT preparation materials, and you'll have this for two years. Like, if you get approved, you have it for two years, and I think you can renew FAP for, like, up to six years or something like that. There's a lot of times that you can re reapply. Um, and then you also get access to the MSAR. How many of you know what the MSAR is? Okay, one person. So this is really important. I want you guys to familiarize yourself with the MSAR. It's the medical school admissions requirements, and it lists the admissions requirements for every single medical school 